live. We're live. We are live here at Port Perry Baptist Church. Welcome, everybody. It is good to have you with us today for our live stream service and for our prayer service, a special day where we want to focus our time in the Word, uh, in prayer, and in song. We want to focus our efforts in prayer, seek God together in prayer. We're glad you're able to join us. Just a couple of things before we begin. Um, one, some things to celebrate, and there's a few. And we're grateful for that in these days to have things to celebrate. We celebrate with Josh and Morgan Bryant in the, uh, the safe arrival of London, uh, their little girl, and with Stephen and Victoria McClellan and the arrival of Caden a few weeks ago, I think. Uh, we celebrate with these families, God's blessing to them and the gift of a new child. And we say congratulations to Brandon and Candace Van Uden. If you were unaware, uh, Brandis and Candace were married yesterday afternoon here at Port Perry Baptist Church. A nice intimate uh, wedding ceremony with their families and a great time of joy and celebration. And we want to celebrate with them, even if we've got to do it from a distance uh, today. We congratulate them and please be praying for these families as they uh, experience God's grace and receive his joy in these great events. So today is a day of prayer. Every day is to be a day of prayer for God's people. We're to grow and practice prayer, to understand it and pursue it and feel its blessings in our lives. Today, in a unique way, along with other Fellowship Baptist churches in Ontario, we are spending time together in prayer. Again, now in this time of service, the elders will be assisting us in a few moments. Uh, they'll be leading us in a prayer of praise, a prayer of confession, a prayer of intercession. And uh, we'll explain more about that in a moment. Uh, but throughout the day, we hope that you will spend time there in your home, in your room, uh, whether as family or in private, that you will spend time together in prayer. And later this afternoon at 4 o'clock, we will meet together on Zoom. Hopefully you have that information and you can join that uh, church-wide Zoom prayer meeting. We have several people uh, prepared in advance to lead us in prayer. You will have opportunity to pray as well. Or if you just, you know, Zoom doesn't, isn't the most comfortable thing for everybody. So if you just show up and your face and your ears, your heart is there as others pray, that will be a great blessing. Just come, just be there. And we'll also give you an opportunity through the message component of Zoom. You can uh, pass along requests while we are praying. And uh, we hope that we can use the technology in a way that we can pick up those requests and pray for some things at the end as well. So we're going to give ourselves to the Lord in prayer. And we're trusting in His grace work in our lives. What we need from Him is a message. We need to know about prayer, what it is, and how we pursue it, we need to learn from Scripture. So we're going to challenge you this morning. We're stepping out of our Baptist liturgy, and we are going to get the message first. So you got, you're stuck with me for the next little bit. And then we're going to move into our time of worship in song and in prayer. And again, the guys, along with our music team, we've got lots of extra music planned for today. They will uh, lead us through that time of worship through prayer. To begin, I would ask you to turn to Acts chapter 4, and as you're turning there, or after you have found that place, I would ask that you bow with me in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for a new day. We thank you for the beauty of this day, and that how it is your creation reveal just how wonderful and magnificent a God you are, both in your power and wisdom, but also in your love and grace. We thank you for a new day. For your care for us, your provision for our needs today, we thank you. And most of all, again, we thank you and humble, with humble hearts, we are amazed at your love for us in Jesus. We thank you for our Savior and for the blessing we have through Christ to have fellowship with you, to have fellowship with one another to know the work of your Spirit in our hearts as we seek you in the Word, and to know the, the great blessing of the gift of prayer in our lives today. For these gifts, we give you thanks, and we would ask for your help. Father, use your Word and the truths we sing, and bless the men as they lead us in prayer. Turn our hearts, Father. There are many distractions. Turn our hearts away from the distractions around us. There are worries and fears and concerns and anxieties that overwhelm us in these days. Father, quiet our minds and hearts. Wherever your people are, I pray that you would quiet them and give us the grace to hear your word, to see with faith, the eyes of faith, the Lord Jesus Christ, and to engage with you in prayer. So we ask for your help now in Jesus' name. Amen. Acts chapter 4. In a moment I'll read beginning at verse 23. 
Scripture teaches us about prayer. In fact, we wouldn't know what prayer is or how we pursue it. We wouldn't, we wouldn't really understand anything about prayer unless God had revealed it to us. And thankfully, He has. And in Scripture, we have instruction for prayer. We can go to Matthew 6. The Lord Jesus teaches the disciples and us how to pray. We have examples in Scripture. Moses, David, the Psalms. And then in the New Testament, we have Jesus not just teaching us about prayer, but his examples of prayer and how often he was in prayer. And then the Apostle Paul, he, we have several times in Scripture a record of how it is Paul prays for God's people, what it is that filled up the content of his prayer. All of these lessons in prayer, it takes a lifetime and more to get inside of all that God has revealed to us about prayer. And we can't begin to get into all of the, the wonder and the beauty and what it means to know and understand and then practice prayer. We can't un- unfold it all this morning. I'm not given that much time. I'm supposed to be shorter than longer today. We'll see how that goes. But I do want to look to Acts chapter 4, verses 23 to 31, and here we are picking up the example really from one of the very first prayer meetings of the early church. As the believers are gathered together, and they give themselves, give their hearts and voices together in prayer to God. In this passage, the believers find themselves in a time of great blessing. We could look back earlier into Acts. We see the gift of the Spirit after Christ has ascended. We see the gifts of the Spirit being, the gift of the Spirit being given to the the first Christians, the apostles, and then those who come to faith in Christ, the the blessing of the presence of the Spirit of God. We see the empowerment of these individuals as they proclaim the gospel in the power of the Spirit, even affirming that message through divine miracles. And the gospel spread. We're told in Acts 2.47 that daily the Lord was adding to their number those who were being saved. Oh, that we could say that in this place, in this community, in these days, that daily the Lord was saving, daily the Lord was adding to the number of the redeemed. That was their experience. It, It was a time of remarkable spiritual blessing, tangible blessing for these first believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. At the same time, it was a period of crisis. In fact, in Acts 4, When we jump into our passage in verse 23, we find Peter and John and the early disciples together um, sharing. Peter and John are going to share a report of their experience with the Jewish leaders. And it wasn't a good one. They've been arrested. They've been threatened. They've been told to be quiet and stop preaching the gospel. Stop preaching about Jesus. They aren't being welcomed by the Jews. The the Jewish leadership don't want to hear more about Jesus who has been raised from the dead and is now ruling and reigning over the universe and is the only Messiah, the only Savior for sinners. They don't want that message. And they don't want the disciples proclaiming that message. So they're being threatened, directly threatened and told to be quiet. It is a time of crisis. I think in some ways... um, This is the reality of the church from that point through to the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because we are the redeemed people of God, we will know times of spiritual blessing. God is never absent from his people. The church will not die out. The church will continue to grow. Christ has promised to to build his church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So times of spiritual blessing. And it may not be every day the Lord adding to the number of the redeemed in every place, but the Lord is daily adding to the number of the redeemed. His church is going to be built. And and even in times of hardship and in hard places, as believers, we look to the Lord and we thank him for the spiritual blessings we have in each and every day. But it's also a day of crisis for Christians in this world. Again, in some ways we think uniquely so today, and maybe that's true. But I would suggest again, from the ascension of Jesus till he returns, every day is to some degree, it's a matter of degrees, is a day of crisis for God's people. It is not until we get to heaven, it is not until we are done with this journey through this life and time and history, when we gather in the presence of the risen King, the Lord of the universe, and and all is completed. It is not until that moment when we are in glory that we will rest from crisis. Today, in these days, every day, we will wake up and we will experience two things. The blessing of God's presence and crisis as we seek to be faithful to Jesus in a sinful world. It's the example of their response that I want you to reflect on for a moment with me. So let me read the passage. Uh, they have come together now, and we're told that they, uh, they lift their voices in prayer. In fact, it's, it's 
you'll see in a moment, it's very powerful that John and Peter, they come and report the, the persecution that they've received. And then we're told the believers together, not just the disciples, all of those early believers, they receive that message, they hear it, and then together, as a congregation, so to speak, they extend their hearts and voices to God in prayer. Let me read the passage, beginning at verse 23, and then I'll just share with you three lessons. Before I read, I'm going to ask Brenda Lee Clemens to close that back door because the glare of the sun off of the snow is giving me spots in my eyes, and it's hard enough to see the camera at the back of the room. I apologize for this awkward moment in our live stream this morning. Acts chapter 4 and verse 23. On their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said. When they heard this, they raised their voices, they together raised their voices in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant Jesus. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. I just want to give you three observations of their prayer, of this prayer, that I hope will help us in this hour as we pray together. I hope it will be of help to you. This passage will be of help as you pray there in your home this afternoon and that it will help us as well as we come together at four o'clock. And beyond that, that God would take these principles, and I'm not sharing anything new. We've, we've shared these things. We've seen these things in this passage and other passages before, but that God would help uh, drill these principles into our, our hearts and minds as we seek to understand and pursue this practice of prayer. So three lessons then. First, we are reminded in this passage that it is the love of God that fuels our prayer. It is the love of God that fuels our prayer. Think for a moment, and we don't have time to, to go back into the book of Luke and track into uh, from book one of Luke's record into book two in the book of Acts and see how Jesus is working directly and remarkably in the saving and the securing for himself this believing community and, and how that community grows. We could look at all of those details. I simply want you, in your memory, hopefully you have recollection of that, those details, remember who these people were and recognize who they are now. Simply put, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God in Christ, has rescued them not only from sin and brought them into a right relationship with God, it's taken them out of their community. It's taken them out of their world, so to speak. I don't mean they are no longer Jewish or they're no longer, they're no longer going to work or be active in their community. I don't mean that at all. I mean their very identity, who they are, is now shaped by the reality of who Jesus is and what he has done for them on the cross. They have come to see and embrace Jesus as the Messiah, as the Savior, as the promised King. God's salvation has been revealed to them. It has been revealed and accomplished in and through the Lord Jesus Christ, and now their lives are devoted to him. Just turn back to one passage, Acts chapter 2. This is on the day of Pentecost when the gift of the Spirit is given to the church. And Peter's remarkable gospel message there at the very beginning, this fisherman is suddenly equipped and qualified and empowered to preach this powerful gospel message. And he describes the point. He gets to the, the crux of the matter, so to speak. Why is he declaring to them the truth about Jesus? And, and he does. He goes back to the Old Testament and he explains to them why it is Jesus was sent to die to rescue them and human beings from sin. I'm just going to pick up the reading at verse 36. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. 
He is Lord and Messiah. He is the anointed one who will rescue and redeem and set up his kingdom forever. He's the one they must bow to. He's the one they must give their lives to. This is the message that Peter proclaims. Verse 37, when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Again, remember, they're in the position of actually having been there and to some degree participating in the crucifixion of the only Savior of sinners, the Lord Jesus Christ. What is their hope? Verse 38, Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. There it is, the gospel message itself. Baptism, uh, repentance and baptism being shorthand for uh, a genuine, humble repentance and faith attachment to Jesus Christ and finding in Christ the forgiveness of sin. All that is wrong with their hearts and ours, the remedy is found in Christ alone. What I want you to see, the only reason these people are together doing what they're doing in prayer, the only reason they can do that and the only reason they want to do that is because of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God that has brought rescue to their sinful hearts and restored them in their relationship with God. To put it another way, please remember that prayer cannot happen without the gospel. Our sin must be dealt with and removed. Your sin and my sin. To think that we can just saunter into the presence of a holy God and ask Him for what we want without dealing with the reality that our heart is bent against Him when we're born into this world. That is, we are rebels. We, we don't want His rule and reign. We just want all of the, the gifts that He might offer to us. That sinful heart and all the expressions of that sinful heart, that must be dealt with if we are going to enter into a relationship and communion with God in prayer. Jesus has come to deal with your sin. Have you dealt with your sin in Christ? Have you confessed your sin? Are, are you wedded to Christ in faith? Do you know the full forgiveness of your sin? Do you know the life that only the Lord Jesus can give? Is your relationship restored with your Creator God? Do you know Him as Father? If that is true, then wonderfully the gospel not only makes prayer possible because the relationship is restored, and I pray that you'll seek Him now. Brothers and sisters in Christ, your relationship is restored. He's your Father. You are His child. He loves to hear you pray. He's opened the way, Jesus has, so that we can communicate and commune with God in prayer. It's possible. More than that, He gives us a heart to pray. Yeah, our heart's longing it can be weak sometimes, and we are easily distracted and overwhelmed by other things. But if you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you want to pray. You may struggle. You may think you're not very good at it. You may not know where to begin. You may not think God always hears you. You may not understand all of the principles even we're laying out today. You may think you'll never get it right. But in your heart of hearts, because of the love of God in Jesus... There is a desire to pray. One of the things I think we need to ask for today is this, simply this, that the Spirit of God will, the love of God in Christ, fanned by the Spirit of God, will just turn our hearts aflame, a raging fire of passion to pray, to find God in prayer, to seek Him, to know Him, to knock and find, to pursue Him in prayer, that God would just, again, the love of God all that Christ is, all that He has done, all that He is doing, all that He will do, that is the fuel of the prayers of God's people. He's made it possible, and He gives us the desire. Jesus has opened up the lines of communication and communion with God, and that's only because He has loved us and given His life so that we could be forgiven and restored and have relationship with our Father in heaven. Tim Keller, in his little book on prayer, puts it this way. Prayer is continuing a conversation that God has started through His Word and His grace. Our praying, then, is a continuation of a conversation that we didn't begin this conversation with God. He, began, he came for us. He found us. He rescued us. He saved us. He awakened our hearts to our need of Jesus and by His Spirit gives us a longing for the right things, like prayer and fellowship with God. It's a conversation and communion that He began. Prayer is our continuation of that work that God has been done. 
So that's the first principle. Remember, and this is why we need the gospel. We need scripture open. We need to take passages of scripture that simply describe how it is God loves and rescues sinners because that is the truth and the, the oil, the, the anointing oil of the Spirit that will lubricate our, our prayer mechanisms and assist us, fuel, if you would, our prayers. But secondly, in this passage we see that the sovereignty of God forms the foundation of our prayer. The sovereignty of God forms the foundation of our prayer. Think about a house for a moment. Everything that is built, a house or any kind of building, needs a good foundation. If the foundation is solid and straight, the building goes up solid and straight. If the foundation isn't solid and straight, then the building is going to be wonky. It may go up, but it's not going to be quite right. Well, similarly, prayer you can think of it in those terms, is easily misunderstood. It doesn't always get built right in the hearts and lives of God's people. We misunderstand prayer, and thus we misuse prayer. Let me just quickly, again, because of time, I just want to point you to these things. If you have questions about some of this, please call me. We'll be glad to visit more about these these challenges in prayer. But prayer is not putting our order in to the celestial Amazon. Other times we've described it as a bellhop where we ring a bell and they at the, at the uh, desk, at the front desk, they, they, they send up the food, they send up the, uh, the bath towels, whatever it is we need, we just hit the bell and they come running, they deliver the goods. And again, much like Amazon today, though you do have to pay for the goods, they're happy to deliver whatever it is you want and they'll give you free delivery. Praying to our God, our Father who has rescued us in His love, is not about putting in our order for the things we want. It's not about giving God information. This is a common mistake we all make to varying degrees. God doesn't need us in prayer to enlighten Him so that He has a better idea of what's happening in the world or in my life, and that will help Him make better choices and decisions about what should happen in my life. God does not need us to give him information in prayer. He already knows. More than this, prayer is not trying our efforts to convince God to come on to our side of things. That somehow God, he, he's over there somewhere, maybe in a position of neutrality, maybe he's charting a different course, and what I must do is pray often enough and passionately enough and and particularly enough that I'm just going to convince God that, oh yes, there's a a praying saint. There's somebody who's really praying, and look look at the things they're praying for. Oh yes, now I'm going to turn my heart and mind and will towards this person. Somehow our prayers are drawing God in a direction that he otherwise would never have found. That's not what prayer is. Again, there's other passages and principles we need to explore. I simply want you to give you the obvious one in this passage in the example of these believers praying, and that is that prayer must be grounded in, founded on the sovereignty of God. The fact that God's in charge. There's no one above him. He's not contingent. He doesn't have to respond to things the way you and I respond to things. He's our sovereign king. Look at their description As they open in prayer, they begin by, again, they're not telling God who He is. They're reminding themselves of who it is they pray to. In verse 24, Sovereign Lord, they said, You made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. They know that they are praying to the God of creation, the God who has created and sustains all of life. He is the King, the Eternal One. He is the ruler of all things and all peoples. They're not going to convince him of anything. He needs no convincing. Notice also in verse 25, their description of the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. You spoke by your Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do the nations rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed one. 
the Peter here, under the inspiration of the Spirit, is saying that passage that David was writing concerning his own life and experience was intentionally being written in anticipation and for the events that had just transpired in their day, that is, the death and resurrection of Jesus, the enemies of Jesus rising up and putting him to death on the cross. So in verse 27, he says, Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. And here they bring the reality of the sovereignty of God into the accomplishment of the salvation of God. God promised through David... The Holy Spirit speaking through David, which, by the way, this is a passage that reinforces our understanding of the nature of Scripture, that it is God's, God is the author of Scripture. David wrote the words, but the Spirit directed his mind and heart in the writing. Under the inspiration of the Spirit, God has promised through David that these events will take place. In time and in history, we're told Herod and Pontius Pilate and, and the enemies of Jesus, they have done their worst, and they nailed him to the tree. They killed him. Jesus Christ, the King of glory, they put him to death on the cross, which was precisely what their evil hearts desired to do. And yet, now put those two things together. The evil they wanted to accomplish in killing the only innocent human being that ever lived is the gloriously good thing that God was doing to rescue the worst of sinners in the world. God's promise to rescue sinners through the Messiah, the Savior, the anointed King, was accomplished as sinners put that anointed King to death on the cross. Again, they they were not trying to obey God. They were fighting against God. But even in their best efforts to fight against God, do you see they accomplished the very thing that God wanted to accomplish? Let me put it to you in a more personal way. Again, it, it... should, if we understand it correctly and apply it correctly, give strength, foundation to the way we pray. What those first believers perceived to be the greatest and most painful tragedy they would ever experience. John, Peter, the women. Remember how devastated they were when they saw Jesus go to the cross. His enemies prevailed. The Messiah, the one they had entrusted their lives to, is dead. Their lives are over. They are devastated. They perceive that event as the worst possible tragedy they could ever possibly endure. And that tragedy, in their eyes, was God's greatest triumph for their eternal good. Do you see what's happening in that passage, in that moment? What they perceive to be the worst thing that could happen in their lives is the thing that is the very best thing that could happen in their lives. And you see, that principle is true not only, it is at the heart of the gospel itself. It's not only true for our salvation when we praise God for that. It's true of every event. It's true of every crisis. That God will never waste a tragedy or a crisis in the lives of his people. But all things will work together for good to them that love God, who are called according to his purpose. We can trust him. We pray to a God who is able and does ordain the steps, the thoughts, the words, the actions. He's in charge. And he says he loves us, and we can trust him. Now let me put this, um, try and put this in practical terms, in terms of how we pray. We must remember that we pray to the God who knows the beginning from the end. He is all-knowing, all-wise, all-powerful, all-good. Let me ask you this question. If that's true of God, that's the God these people are praying to, that's the God that we know and love in Jesus and we pray to, if that's true, he's all-knowing, all-wise, all-powerful, all-good, why do you want to change his mind? Do we really believe that my idea about what should be happening in any particular circumstance in my life could be better than his? This has had a profound impact on my praying to the point where not, and we're going to talk in a moment, not that we shouldn't ask for specific things or plead for the good gifts in particular ways. We, we must do that. But at the end of all of that praying, I think it is right for us, as we'll sing in a few moments, 
to say, not my will, but yours be done. Lord, I'm praying. I, I think these are the right things. I think these are the best things, and we're pleading for these things. But, Father, you know what's best. I'm just going to trust the answer to this prayer into your hands. You do what you know to be best for me, for us, for the church, for our community. It allows us, it frees us from the responsibility of, if I, if I just pray in the right way, with the right words, enough times, I will be able to convince God to do It'll be done. That's not, again, that's not the foundation for our prayer. Our prayer is we pray to a God who already knows, and He can do, and He will. So pray. Plead with Him. Pour your heart out to Him with this powerful confidence and foundation. We pray to the sovereign of the universe. We might ask the question at this point, well, then why do we, if God is sovereign in the way you describe, why do we pray? Why should we pray? What difference does prayer make? Let me just give you two things really quickly. One, remember that God weaves our prayers into the fabric of his eternal plans. God weaves the prayers of his people into the fabric of his eternal plans. To put it another way, God has ordained our praying and he's ordained his answering to our prayers. God uses prayer. That's why prayer works, if we want to put it that way. It doesn't work because we've somehow brought some passion or energy that was lacking and somehow God is able to do things he otherwise could not. It works because God says, I am going to accomplish these things through a people that love me and are devoted to me and plead with me for these good things. That our prayers become an essential component to God accomplishing his plans which were ordained from before the creation of the world. That's why we pray. Secondly, Remember always that in our praying, our souls are strengthened, our hearts are comforted, our lives are equipped, our understanding is improved. Remember that it is God doing a work in us through prayer. We're not working on Him in prayer. He's working on us. Praise God that He uses our prayers and He has ordained it to be so, and that should drive you to your prayer closet. That should motivate you to pray. Because God has promised he will use your prayers in accomplishing his good purposes in this world. And you should be driven to prayer simply because you will meet with the eternal God who loves you more than you can know and wants to transform your life here and now and forever. Why would we forfeit opportunities to go to God in prayer? This God, this great and glorious God loves us and has opened the way into his presence through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we have fellowship with him in prayer. Why, why, why will we not pray? God does a great work in us as we give ourselves to him in prayer. All right. The love of God fuels our prayers. The sovereignty of God gives a foundation to our prayers. And then finally, the purpose of God gives us a focus in our prayers. This is answering the question, what do we pray for and why? Simply put, these people, let me, let me let's see the words. Verse 29. Now... Lord, consider their threats. Enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. I have little doubt that they prayed much more than this, that Luke is recording uh, a condensed version or, or the key part, the center part of their praying. I suspect the praying probably went on for a while. So it's significant then that Luke says, here's, here's the heart of what they prayed. Notice that they do not pray for a change in their circumstances. They do not pray, get us out of here. At least not directly, not primarily. In a beautiful way, and it's a phrase I think we need to think about and somehow incorporate into our prayers when we face challenges and threats. They simply say, sovereign God, who has rescued us through your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and given us eternal life, will you consider their threats? Take their threats into account. Lord, they aren't saying God isn't already aware. They're just trusting those threats into God's hand. God, we can't do anything about the threats. We're just going to leave that to you. If it leads to imprisonment and more persecution and death, we'll trust that to you. If you lead us to a time of peace and safety, and we can live out the gospel and, and share the gospel in a time of peace and safety, then we will leave that to you. They entrust their circumstance to God. And then they ask God for the resources 
the courage. They ask for the stuff they need to do the thing that God has called them to do. To speak the gospel with clarity and boldness. In a unique way, the apostles at the center of this prayer meeting, they are uniquely called. As apostles, they form a foundational stone in the building of the church. And they are given unique place and unique power. The miracles they call for, I don't think this is instructing us to pray for and expect God to do miracles through me, the way he did through Peter. It is bound up the miracles with their apostolic witness and mission. They are to proclaim the good news of the gospel, calling lost sinners to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and the miracles, like with Jesus, the miracles display, they affirm the presence, the authority of God in the message. God is about this. That's why they can do miracles. We simply need to see that they pray. What they ask for are the resources for them to be faithful to Jesus and the task that he's put in their hands. And that's what we should ask for too. So you might ask, so then we don't ask God for things like food and housing and health and recovery? Well, no. Remember, Jesus himself teaches us to go to God for our daily bread. In Matthew 6, in his lessons on prayer, we're told to go to God and ask Him for the things we need, material needs, we, the stuff you need to live in this world. We are to go to ask for Him for them because we can't get them anywhere else. If we have what we need for life, it comes from God. And Jesus says we should pray to that end. Give us this day our daily bread. But remember that Jesus begins that lesson in prayer. Listen, do you remember how He begins? Our Father in heaven. It's a recognition of the otherness of God. Hallowed be your name. Your name is to be honored, glorified, magnified. Your kingdom come, your reign be extended in the lives of people. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's not just a component to Jesus' lesson on prayer. That's a theme that undergirds all of Jesus' lesson in prayer. And that's, I think, what is reflected in this prayer in Acts chapter 4. It's not that we don't ask for things, but we are not all about asking for things. That's not, what, that's not at the center of our praying. That's not the focus of our praying. Our focus in prayer as God's people, like these first believers, is to plead with Him, Father, give us what we need so that we will be faithful to Jesus no matter what. We will not give up what you've called us to do. We will not shrink back when people are upset with our message. We, we will not cower in a corner when people don't like how it is we live our lives or how it is we uh, define our lives or define our relationships. We will be faithful to Jesus. And we will not grow angry and bitter and frustrated when there are crises and attacks. We will be people of... The, the fruit of the Spirit will grow in us. Give us the fruit of the Spirit that we might be known for love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and all of those beautiful qualities that are hardwired into our Savior's heart. Hardwire them into our hearts. We pray that we would be faithful no matter what. And then out of that faithfulness, we pray for physical health and recovery. We pray for our daily bread. We pray for a, a, a warm home on a cold winter's day. We pray for uh, uh, the future of our children and our grandchildren. Uh, we, we pray for the prosperity of a place of employment so we can work and make money and purchase the bread we need for each day. We, we trust every practical need into our Father's hands. But brothers and sisters in Christ, please pray that God would guard our hearts from putting those at the center of our prayer. Those flow out of this focus. Jesus, we're here for you. Give us what we need to be here for you. Help us to be faithful to the task. I've been watching. Um, oh, I've got to wrap this up. We've got to get to some praying. It's not, it's not enough for me to talk about prayer today. We're supposed to pray. Um, so let me close with this. I've been watching historical, uh, a historical drama on World War II recently. And one of the things that strikes me, sometimes in a little too graphic a way, is the desperate challenge of the soldier in that war. And whether it was in Europe or um, in Asia, wherever it was, in North Africa, 
They often struggled with a lack of food, a lack of clothing, a lack of shelter, a lack of medical care, all the things that are necessary for life and all the things that were necessary so that they could accomplish their mission. They oftentimes had to do their mission without the things that they so desperately needed. And the picture could be quite ugly at times. But it wasn't just about hungry men or cold men or sick men. There was a battle to win. There was ground to be taken. There was a mission that had to be accomplished. There was an enemy to defeat. There was a victory to pursue. They were there, and all of those resources were a means to an end to fuel the soldier in the mission that they'd been entrusted with. John Piper has described prayer in this way, helpfully so, like that radio on the battlefield, soldiers, believers on the front lines of a spiritual battle, calling to headquarters for what? For the resources they need to complete the mission. That's what the soldiers needed, that, those supplies. It wasn't to make them comfortable on the battlefield. It was to give them the tools, the hardware they needed to be faithful and accomplish the mission that they had been called to. And while soldiers in World War II had to struggle with inadequate supplies much of the time, brothers and sisters in Christ, we do not struggle with a lack of supplies. We have the promise from Almighty God, our Father in Heaven, we have the promise of complete and perfect provision for all the, every mission, every task, everything He has called us to do. He has what we need and He has promised to give it to us. More than this, we have the promise of a complete and ultimate ultimate victory that has already been secured in the death and resurrection of Jesus. We win! We are not soldiers struggling on the spiritual battlefield in the hopes that somehow our efforts will accomplish the mission. The mission is won! God has promised all that we need as we pursue the day that victory is revealed to all of humanity. And so we pray. God has promised He has what you need. He has promised the victory has been secured. The mission He has entrusted with is not in our hands, it's in His hands. The resources are not in us, they're in Him. And so He says He calls us to pray, to pray without ceasing. He calls us to pray. The love of this God being the fuel of our prayers, the sovereignty, the power and wisdom and knowledge of this God being the foundation of our prayers, and the purpose of this God, the mission of God in the gospel being the focus of our prayers, we are called to pray. And so we will. I want to begin, I want to read for you a prayer from a, what's called the Valley of Vision. It's some old prayers and some old language, bear with me. But I want to read this together. I'm going to invite the music team. You guys can come and get set up. We're going to go right from this into some music, and then the gentlemen and the elders are going to assist us in our prayer as we sing this morning. But I want to begin with this prayer about prayer. Again, it's found in the Valley of Vision. O oh Lord, in prayer I launch far out into the eternal world. And on that broad ocean, my soul triumphs over evils on the shores of mortality. Time, with its amusements and cruel disappointments, never appears inconsiderate as it does then. In prayer, I see myself as nothing. I find my heart going after thee with intensity and long with vehement thirst to live to thee. Blessed be the strong gales of your spirit that speed me on my way to the new Jerusalem. In prayer, all things here below will vanish. And nothing seems important except holiness of heart and the salvation of others. In prayer, all my worldly cares, fears, anxieties can disappear and are of as little significance as a puff of wind. In prayer, my soul inwardly exults with lively thoughts at what thou art, what thou art doing in thy church. And I long that thou shouldst give thyself a great name for, from sinners returning to Zion in salvation. In prayer, I am lifted above the frowns and flatteries of life and taste heavenly joys. Entering into the eternal world, I can give myself to thee with all my heart to be thine forever. In prayer, I can place all my concerns in thy hands to be entirely at thy disposal having no will or interest of my own. 
In prayer, I can intercede for my friends, ministers, sinners, the church, thy kingdom to come. I intercede with the greatest freedom and ardent hopes as a child would plead with his father, as a lover to their beloved. Help me, help us to be all in prayer and to never cease in praying. Amen.